Now, let's start with Alonso. Thank you for being here today, Alonso. Glad to be here. Can you share with us the importance of native bees and honeybees? Well, bees are very, very important. Uh, for one, although a lot of different animals can act as pollinators, uh, none are better adapted or, or better evolved to be better pollinators. They got fuzzy little hairs on their bodies, they carry pollen better, and uh, not only do they need pollen and nectar, but they need to feed it to their young, so they're constantly looking for flowers. And on top of that, um, they can memorize things, so they'll know which flowers they got rewarded with. They'll go visit those same kinds of flowers, which means they don't waste time, and it also means that the pollen gets the right plant and the plants don't waste time. So um, since also about 72% of our agricultural crop species are from uh, animal pollinated crops, we really do need bees around. Because one out of every three bites of food we eat comes from a pollinator. Yeah, from different species. Yeah. Now, can you share with us the difference between wasps and bees? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, wasps sometimes give bees a bad rap, at least some of them do. And while we do have bees, and bees tend to be uh, thick-bodied, fuzzy things that feed their babies both pollen and nectar, wasps have a thin, that wasp waist, and they tend to be less hairy. And even though they do nectar at flowers, um, they, um, they also bring, uh, bring insects that they sting to feed to their young. So they can act as pollinators, but are not as good as they are. Now, yellow jackets in particular, this time of year, they um, come visit all sorts of different things like picnic tables. Um, they're the ones that give the bees the bad rap because they can get a little aggressive. If you kick over their nests, uh, they'll come out and sting. And so since people can't tell the difference, the bee gets the bad rep reputation for the wasp. Ah, well, I understand that you're an expert in native bees and that you also raise them at your nature center in Virginia. <gasps> well, there's a bee now. Okay. All right. Well, um, I wouldn't call myself an expert, but I do know how important bees are. And so uh, I do value them and try to learn a little bit about them. And again, what most people learn about bees is really about the European honeybee, uh, which was introduced in, uh, into the USA uh, back in 1622 down in Jamestown, Virginia. And um, it does have a queen laying eggs, lots of workers that collect uh, pollen and nectar that then make honey so they can live over um, when there's no flowers around. Uh, and that's what most people know uh, about bees. And how um, about the native bees then? What are, what are the differences there? Well, about 20,000 types of bees are on the whole world, about 4,000 here in North America. Um, the vast majority of those are native. And they're quite different from, the, uh, from the, the social honeybee. Most of them are solitary, which means it's a single mom and she lives in her own home. She's the queen, she's the worker, she's everything. And um, so she, um, she basically lives by herself and is not in a big group like all the other bees are. Sounds a lot like people. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I know that you're going to be looking at also identifying some of these different bees. Yes, and with 4,000 kinds, it's very difficult to know them all. But there's a few groups you can kind of tell apart. For one, um, the bumblebees, which are social and have hives for about a year at a time, they're medium sized to large, they got big fuzzy bodies on them, so they're kind of easy to tell apart. Then you've got the much larger uh, carpenter bees, which are solitary, they got a shiny abdomen to them. Uh, they're another kind that's easy to tell apart. Then you've got the shiny, metallic looking sweater helicted bees. And um, those are pretty small and easy to tell apart. And the final group people might notice are the mason bees. What they do is they use mud to find holes and then make little rooms or cells in there. And um, that's another kind of uh, easy bee, I guess, to kind of tell apart. You know, and Alonso, I know that many folks in our audience are probably afraid of bees or other buzzing insects. And actually, I used to be a little bit afraid of those too, but you really helped me to overcome that fear. And can you tell us some of those stinging facts and fears? Yeah, well, it's true. Now, bees, uh, pretty much bees can sting, and at least the female bees can, because a stinger is a modified ovipositor, an egg layer. So boys don't lay eggs, they can't sting. Um, and the native bees, they can sting more than once, another difference from honeybees, but they don't want to sting. And a big reason for that is that they're solitary. They don't have the hive mentality. It's not that um, I don't lay eggs, I got to protect my hive, my nest, no matter what. For them, if she dies defending her nest, then nobody's going to take care of the young and she's not going to lay any more eggs, so they don't want to sting. They're incredibly passive and docile. And although bees can sting, they're not likely to do that. Um, we can actually do a little experiment that might uh, help us with that. Um, we don't want to harass bees in any ways, because that's when they might sting. But just to show you how peaceful they are, what we might be able to do is actually pet a bumblebee, just to show you that they're pretty peaceful. And we do have some bumblebees right over here. So, Kimberly, if, if you'd like, just reach over and pet one, and just notice how peaceful these things really are. 
see if they hold still for you long oh, enough. Oh, wow, look at that. And again, they don't so even nice. notice you're there. And it's got huge pollen baskets yep. on its, its hind doing, legs. It's doing, it's, it's, she's doing her job. Can I pet this one too? That, there you go, even an even friendlier oh, yeah. bee. So you don't want right. to bother bees, but they really are peaceful things. They, they, they don't really want to bother people. No, they don't. Thank you so much, bee. All right, and so how can we help native bees? What would be some ways that we might be able to do that? Well, there's lots of neat ways we can help with bees. Most of them have to do with agricultural practices. Um, for one, um, the way that we garden or raise crops, whenever we dig up the soil, especially if it's acres and acres of, of, uh, of uh, places that we till, since 70% of the native bees nest underground, we destroy a lot of those nests. So we don't want to do that. Not only that, but when you have huge fields of a monoculture, one single crop that just blooms for a short period of time, the bees have nothing else to eat during the rest of the year. Or um, even worse, they may not like that one kind of flower anyways and not visit it. Um, or um, what made up the peppany is there's not enough uh, little edges and places like that for them to nest. So we have to uh, be careful about how we do that. Uh, another thing would be um, the use of pesticides. I mean, w when we start spraying the killed pests, we sometimes accidentally get the pollinators as well. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful about that. Um, then there's some, uh, some very simple ways that we can look at right here close at home. For example, we can put up bee shelters for them. About 30% of the bees nest in little tubes and cavities. And you can either buy some ready-made deals or you can take a piece of wood and drill into them in different size holes for different size bees. Or as these guys are doing right over here, yeah. you can build some bee bundles. You can actually get a nice little uh, piece of bamboo, cut it just above the node so you got one hollow end and you got one solid end put all the open ends together, put it into something, and you got yourself a little place where the bees can nest. The, the mason bees will come over here, build off little walls where uh, inside there'll be a little basket of pollen and nectar, and those things are gonna, be the, uh, are, are gonna be where the eggs will be laid and where the babies will be laid. So you can do your own part to really help bees. And it's great to see our students and Ms. Manning and Ms. McAllister helping out. And the bee too, I think the bee enjoys that uh, you're creating a habitat. Yeah. And it's great to see all our bees that came by to visit us as well. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Alonso, for being here today to share the importance of native bees and some of the ways that we can help because that's very important. And it's really true that they're so important to have healthy ecosystems, right? Absolutely. We do need the bees, and it's not just the honeybees. We also uh, need all the other kinds of bees as well. So we can all do our part, and we hope that we all do.